the Pokemon craze took over the world during the 90s when Pokemon Red and Blue, or Green in Japan, hit the Game Boy. The addictive mechanic of catching and battling the little pocket monsters with an epic RPG adventure wrapped around it mesmerised gamers. I must say my tank of a Venusaur destroyed all who opposed him back in the day, and the series has been going strong ever since. Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee are a reimagining of sorts of Pokemon Yellow and are meant to be more accessible, ready to make Pokemon fans of a new generation of gamers. Do they achieve this? Well, I'm Glenn for Switch Up. Thank you to Nintendo for the review copy, and now, let's find out. In terms of gameplay, on paper, Pokemon Let's Go works in the same way that all mainline Pokemon games have done down the years. You travel from town to town, catching Pokemon to add to your team, and battling the leader of each gym in the aforementioned towns to earn their badges and prove yourself worthy of taking on the Elite Four for ultimate glory and prestige, entering the Hall of Fame while you're at it. Having said all that, this is meant to be a more streamlined experience, serving as an entry point for newcomers, and with this in mind, there are a few small tweaks that change the gameplay from that of the originals for better or for worse. The first and biggest change is the removal of the random battles. Like most RPGs, the older Pokemon games saw you thrown into a random battle with wild Pokemon every so often when traversing through certain hotspots, most predominantly whilst walking through tall grass or through caves. You could either choose to defeat these Pokemon for experience points or capture them and add them to your party. The Pokemon Let's Go games changed this feature. While Pokemon are now shown on the screen, which sounds like a great idea at first, allowing you to dodge battles when you want to by walking around them. However, when you do engage with a wild Pokemon, you do not battle them at all and instead move straight to the catching option. You can throw a Pokeball at the creature to attempt to catch them, with the colour of the circle in front of them and the timing of your throw attributing to how successful you are. My main issue with this is as follows. Why take the time to finally fix what had been an annoyance in Pokemon games for years namely the overabundance of random battles, by showing you where they are and allowing you to avoid them should you wish, and then remove the battling aspect too. As a kid, I'll admit I hated being able to only walk about 10 yards in a cave before yet another Zubat or Geodude battle as much as the next person, but surely the fix here was making the wild Pokemon visible. Doing this and then not allowing you to actually fight these creatures feels like a bit of an oxymoron. When you do enter the catching stage, you must flick your Joy-Con in order to throw the Pokeball at them. As mentioned briefly earlier, timing this correctly will increase your chances of being successful, and you can use items such as berries to make this process easier. As in the previous games, you can buy stronger Pokeballs as you progress, which will help you catch higher level Pokemon. Successfully catching wild Pokemon will net you experience points for your party in much the same way that battling them would have done so in the past. I should point out that battling is of course still a big part of the game, with there being plenty of random Pokemon trainers to be found across the land. Another change for this series is that you can now change your party lineup on the go, rather than having to access one of the PCs as used to be the case. Now a press of the Y button while looking at your party in the pause menu will bring up your entire selection of Pokemon, and you can change your lineup there and then. Whilst this does make the game easier, in that you can switch in fresher Pokemon if you've taken a bit of a hammering through trainer battles in between Pokemon Center visits, it does also make things a lot more convenient, and potentially stops the age old problem of certain Pokemon that you catch becoming almost irrelevant as you completely forget you've even got them half the time. Battles are as strategic as ever, with the classic turn based rock paper scissors type formula of certain Pokemon types being stronger than others, being as engaging as it always has been. But the game just feels a little too easy at times. In fact, you're not even allowed to enter one of the gyms until you have shown that you have a Pokemon in your possession that is super effective against the gym leader's type. I mean seriously, have a day off will ya? What is the world coming to? If I want to go in and fight the rock specialist Brock without having a water or a grass type with me, and promptly get my behind handed to me, then surely that's my prerogative, isn't it? Well, apparently not. I do, however, like that this entry focuses on the original 151 Pokemon. In a game that is trying to streamline its franchise a little, this was a wise move. Of course, with games called Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, these are your two starter Pokemon, but thankfully you can find and catch the original three starter Pokemon, Bulbasaur, Charmander and Squirtle, 
over the course of your adventure. Focusing on the controls just for a moment, these are interesting to say the least. When playing in docked mode, you can only use a single Joy-Con, or of course the new Pokeball peripheral. Bizarrely, the Pro Controller is not supported at all. You cannot choose to opt out of the motion control based method of catching Pokemon unless you are playing in handheld mode at which point button controls are used instead. I really struggle to understand the point of enforcing a certain control type on people. Using a single Joy-Con does work well enough for the most part when moving around the game world and the motion controls are fairly accurate although sometimes the ball did seem to careen off to the side when I felt I didn't do too much different to previous times. One nice touch is that by shaking the second Joy-Con, the second player can enter the game and assist you in battle. This works quite well and although it doesn't quite elevate the game into co-op territory, being more of an assist mode if anything, it at least makes use of the second Joy-Con and is a nice addition. I will say that I have not tried the Pokeball peripheral so I cannot comment either way on how this works. The game is still a lot of fun and retains the classic Pokemon feeling for the most part but it is clearly looking at getting a few Pokemon Go fans in to the point where it can link to the Pokemon Go app and it does lose just a little of what made Pokemon so endearing, well for me at least, in the process and its gameplay scores 15 out of 20 with controls also receiving 15 out of 20. Although this is not a game that is pushing your Switch to any sort of technological limits it certainly does look charming. The aesthetic borrows heavily from the anime series in terms of characters and sound bites, and I'm sure fans will get a serious kick out of this. The extra little cutscenes and animations, such as when Pikachu runs down your character's arm and leaps into the arena ready for battle, are lovely, and it's always delightful to see a stage or a game world from an old game brought to life on current hardware. The battles all look great with each different move afforded its own animation and it really does bode well for the generation 8 Pokemon game that this one is already head and shoulders above anything that has come before it and I'm intrigued to see how they can improve this series further aesthetically in the next instalment. The audio is another highlight of the game with familiar tunes sounding better than ever and sounds such as Pikachu's cry instantly evoking nostalgic memories. The battle music gets blood pumping as it always did and each area has its own theme. Graphics get 16 out of 20 and audio gets 17 out of 20. The Pokemon Let's Go games cost £49.99, €59.99 or $59.99, but as always seems to be the case with the eShop, the physical games can be found for a bit cheaper, albeit maybe not as much as in some cases. Although this is the standard price for a game released by Nintendo, and should you wish to catch them all, this game can be a serious time sink, this does still seem a little bit pricey. There is some post-game content that ramps up the difficulty and, again, could increase longevity for anyone with the stamina for it, but I struggle to see this as a game that should sit at the same pricing tier as Mario Odyssey or Breath of the Wild. If you seek out the cheaper physical version, then you will certainly get your money's worth and value scores 15 out of 20. To conclude, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee retain enough of the old formula to appeal to any current Pokemon fans as long as you can accept the changes that have seemingly been made to help push the game towards a more casual audience too. Younger children who may never have played a Pokemon game before will absolutely love this too, although I am tinged with a little sadness that when we were children we were trusted by game developers to enjoy and conquer a game without it having to be simplified to the standard that seems to be the case these days. However, I digress. Fans of the Pokemon Go series, those who may never have even ventured into console gaming before, may also find a lot to like here. For what it is, which is an entry point to the series, whilst the next main entry is being developed, it does its job well enough and it receives a switch up score of 78%. 
thank you everybody for watching remember to leave a like if you like what you've just seen and consider subscribing if you haven't done so already for all things switch all the time and as always happy gaming